Well, now we're going to hear someone that we've been looking forward to hearing, Brother Fred France, President of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, a member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. Brother France has been in the truth over 71 years. He's been serving at Bethel for about 65 years, 65 years of faithful service. Now, Brother Franz is going to speak to us on the subject, Decision. Brother Franz. Presenting oneself before a large audience like this of men and women of advanced age facing uh, the serious problems of life, well, addressing an audience like that uh, makes a person feel very responsible indeed to say something worthwhile of uh, lasting benefit. And so uh, I just feel a little bit awestruck here at this excellent audience this morning. And I do hope that I may say something uh, edifying to all of you and of uh, real lasting benefit in the service of the Most High God. Now, all of us have made a decision in life. It reminds me of what the Apostle Paul wrote in uh, his letter to the Corinthians, the first one, and chapter 7, verse 37, where discussing uh, the uh, matter of staying single or getting married, he uh, says that uh, everyone uh, gets settled in his own mind uh, and uh, that he has made a decision either one way or the other way well now you and I we have had to make a decision in life and it is because of our decision that we find ourselves here this morning now I recall women missing a little bit, and I hope you'll excuse me for it, how uh, as a growing young man, I had made the decision to become a Presbyterian minister. And I had also joined the recruits for the Presbyterian ministry, and was headed that way. Because I thought that was the highest profession of that one could hold in life and serving the supreme being of the universe. Well, I'm very, very glad that uh, I was directed away from that ministry in the Presbyterian Church. And it was the uh, getting of the truth, the Bible truth, that steered me in the right ministry, the ministry that is really acceptable to the God of the universe, the one who bears the unique name uh, Jehovah. Well, this was back in the year 1913, and I was uh, pursuing my goal. I was in the sophomore year at the University of Cincinnati and I took up the study of Greek particularly because uh, you have to study uh, the Greek New Testament uh, as well as the Hebrew scriptures when you go to a theological seminary and so I was preparing myself with that in view. Well, it was in uh, the spring of that year that my oldest brother, Albert, who was up in Chicago, 
came in contact with the truth. And uh, realizing uh, that I was preparing uh, for the Christian ministry, he sent me down a piece of literature for my examination. And uh, I recall how uh, toward the end of the month of May of 1913, when I was waiting to go down to the Wednesday night prayer, praise, and testimony meeting at the uh, Presbyterian Church, why, I bethought myself of this little book on Where Are the Dead, the lecture that had uh, been given and that had been published in a small booklet form. So uh, I started reading it having a little time before leaving the house, and it just proved fascinating. And my eyes uh, just uh, opened wide to things I had never uh, discussed or discerned in the Bible before, although I was a daily Bible reader from my 13th year of life onward. And the booklet was so fascinating I could not lay it down and I took it with me and I had about a mile to walk down to the church and I was reading that little booklet all the way down there and sat on the church door steps on arriving until the doors were open and I could enter. And uh, I recall at the close of the meeting, uh, uh, which was addressed by the pastor of the church, Dr. Watson, I went up to him and showed him this little book. And I said, Dr. Watson, uh, what do you know about this? And he took the little booklet and opened it up and turned it this way and that way. And then he slapped it shut. And he says, oh, that must be some of that Russell stuff. What does he know about where the dead are? Here, Fred, you take it and read it for yourself. And you'll see. Well, that was the worst thing he could have done to give me the book back. <laughs> and I recall as I turned away from him, I was really disappointed. And I said to myself, I do not care what he thinks about it. This is the truth. That was what I said in my own heart. And so I finished the little book and uh, my brother Albert came down from Chicago and he had uh, volumes of the studies in the scriptures, which had been written by the first president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, uh, Charles Taze Russell. And so that uh, vacation period, I was reading uh, those books. Being underage, my father had me go back to the university, and I took up uh, the uh, junior year at the uh, University of Cincinnati, Ohio, pursued my study of Greek uh, in that uh, year of uh, study and made progress. Well, it developed that because of the scholastic uh, excellence, why uh, the authorities uh, uh, recommended me to take up examinations for uh, the Cecil Rhodes Scholarship to uh, Oxford College in England. Now that was something uh, for which to aspire on the part of a worldly person. So uh, I was sent up to the university, a state university in Columbus, Ohio, Ohio State University. Uh, their football team used to play with the Cincinnati University football team. And I spent several days up there taking uh, the uh, written examinations. Well, there were two of us that won the prize. Only the uh, other boy, uh, he uh, exceeded me in uh, athletics. I was more of a, a gymnast, you see, working with the parallel bars and the trapeze and so on. But he was a field man, and Oxford College, England, goes in for sports, and so they would prefer a man of that caliber. At any rate, uh, 
I was scheduled uh, uh, to go to Oxford College. Well, now, this was the year 1914, and I had made progress in uh, the understanding of the truth. And what was it that we were expecting to occur in 1914? Well, from my reading of the literature up to that point, why, uh, we were expecting the end of the Gentile times, the appointed times of the nations to take place in uh, the fall of the year of 1914. And here I was attending a university and uh, with uh, further study uh, at Oxford College University. For what? Well, I thought it over. For, for what? Here we're expecting the end of the world, the end of the system of things in the fall of 1914. And here you're going in uh, for a worldly education and uh, getting a, a job outside in the world. It's going to be destroyed. What's the sense of it? So I thought things over seriously, and I wrote the authorities and told them that I had lost interest in uh, the Cecil Rhodes Scholarship, and uh, I was not accepting it. So I... I turned it down. Well, of course, that was very disappointing to them, but uh, I chose the right course. If I had not made that decision, I certainly would not be here this morning uh, with all of you. So uh, I had now gotten in uh, association with the uh, uh, Bible students, the Cincinnati, Ohio congregation of the International uh, Bible Students Association. And uh, it was at the beginning of the year 1914 that I had the uh, unexpected pleasure of uh, meeting the president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, Charles Taze Russell. Well, for the summer of that year, there were two general conventions billed. Uh, for the Bible students, one up in Clinton, Iowa, and that converged on uh, the other larger and longer one at Columbus, Ohio. And uh, so Charles Taze Russell, or Pastor Russell as we called him, was billed to come down from his engagement up at Clinton, Iowa uh, to uh, Columbus, Ohio. And uh, that is what he did. So it was my pleasure to uh, hear Charles Taze Russell serve on the program at uh, the Columbus, Ohio uh, Convention. And of course, I got more and more absorbed uh, in this work. I wanted to uh, quit the university, but my father says, no, you go on. And uh, it's valuable because uh, it'll help you to get uh, an occupation in this world and uh, make a living. So I had to go on into uh, the third year and uh, then toward uh, the end of uh, my third year in the University of Cincinnati, my father, who had now become more acquainted with the truth himself, well, he said, Fred, if you want to, uh, you can leave the university. So I quit immediately and uh, took up uh, the call torture work, as we called it then, or the pioneer work uh, that uh, we uh, call it today. So uh, Jehovah God's Spirit was uh, directing his uh, dedicated slave in the right direction. Well, in that year of 1914, as stated before, uh, we held a, a convention uh, at uh, Columbus, Ohio, which I was uh, privileged to uh, attend. And uh, I recall how that on June the 28th, right in uh, the midst of that convention, why there was a shot fired that was heard around the world. 
and the repercussions of it affected the entire world. That was the murder of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary uh, down there in Serbia. He was assassinated. And uh, I recall how newspapers uh, came out with the information uh, the very next day. And uh, when we read uh, the uh, newspaper there at, uh, at Columbus, Ohio, why, uh, we said, aha, there it is, there it is. The Gentile times are drawing to their close because now the nations were uh, beginning to uh, squabble together uh, menacingly. They had been preparing for years uh, for uh, a military confrontation, especially between the seventh world power of Bible history, the Anglo-American world power, and uh, the dictatorial power, uh, which at that time was represented by Kaiser Bill uh, of Germany. And uh, sure enough, uh, one month passed, and exactly one month uh, after the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary, World War II uh, broke out and began to involve more and more nations so that it really became World War I of human history. And uh, in order to uh, fight this fight of all fights up till then, why they had to uh, recruit men for the army. Yes, they, they registered them. And uh, all the young men, uh, they had to sign up as of military age and, and subjecting themselves to military call. And finally, uh, Something happened uh, with the United States of America. Well, it was in the year 1917, or 16, rather, that uh, Charles Taze Russell gave his uh, last lecture. It was out here in California, uh, Los Angeles, as I recall, and uh, uh, he had been troubled with cystitis in his later years of life, and uh, I remember how uh, uh, he said to his secretary, Mentor Sturgeon, now I'll start speaking, and then when I have to leave the platform, you come on. You've heard me give this lecture uh, plenty of times, and you know just how it proceeds, and uh, you carry on, and I'll return, and... Uh, till I have to leave, and uh, you take over again. And I think it was six times that Charles Taze Russell uh, had to leave the platform in the course of his lecture. And he uh, could talk a long while, too, and uh, really give you uh, something worthwhile staying there and listening for a long while. So... Uh, uh, he finished his uh, lecture, and he boarded the train that night. A sister uh, there in the audience, uh, uh, seeing the plight in which he uh, found himself, well, she uh, gave uh, his secretary money for them to have just a, a little parlor suite on the Pullman train, so that uh, Menta Sturgeon, the secretary, and Russell were together. And... Uh, uh, Charles Russell, in his terminal illness, he had to uh, get up and down, and Menta Sturgeon said that uh, he almost wore himself out uh, lifting up uh, Brother Russell and letting him down again. So uh, Charles Taze Russell, you recall, had written these studies in the scriptures. There were six volumes of those studies in the scriptures. The, sixth and last one being entitled to the, uh, the new creation. And uh, we were expecting seven volumes, like the seven thunders of Revelation. Uh, seven volumes from the pen of Charles Taze Russell. And I recall how Mentor Sturgeon 
uh, saw that uh, Russell was dying and Russell realized it himself and he pried him with some questions and he said, what about the seventh volume? And uh, Russell replied, someone else will have to write it. So uh, Russell died on that train and as he was lying there, I recall how Menta Sturgeon opened up the a door and he called the Negro porter and he says come here and see how a Christian dies and the porter looked in and was very impressed because uh, Russell was a magnificent looking man he made an impression and uh, people uh, would stop as he approached and walked by and they would train their eyes on him and follow him he was so uh, impressive looking so uh, the uh, porter was uh, deeply impressed. Uh, doubtless his heartstrings uh, tugged at him as he saw uh, this uh, excellent-looking uh, man uh, dying there. Well, he did die on the train, and uh, uh, the train master was notified, and uh, so... Uh, uh, the uh, train was now passing through Texas, and it stopped at uh, Pampa, Texas, and there they took the body off and uh, put the body in a, a big laundry basket that was there on this small uh, platform before this uh, small station. And uh, later on, the body was taken care of by uh, uh, funeral people, and then was brought to Pittsburgh, where uh, Pastor Russell, Charles Taze Russell, uh, was interred. And you can go to his grave uh, there at Resurrection Park, as I recall the name of the little uh, plot of land uh, uh, that uh, is reserved for Bible students, a prominence to be buried. And uh, you can see uh, the pyramid that was resurrect uh, that was reared up uh, over his grave because at, at that time you know uh, we thought that the great pyramid of Giza e uh, Egypt uh, was the Bible in stone and that its interior ascending passages and uh, rooms uh, illustrated the divine plan of the ages uh, which was the title of the first volume of scripture studies as written by Charles Taze Russell. Well, the newspaper, as I recall, reading the news the next day after his uh, death in the Cincinnati Times Star, why on the front page came out with the announcement, Pastor Russell dies and the world does not mourn. Wasn't that a cruel thing to say? But we, Bible students, mourned, and when we held our Wednesday night midweek praise and prayer and testimony meeting there in our uh, meeting place, why, it was indeed a gloomy meeting because we uh, felt keenly the loss of our beloved uh, pastor, Charles Taze Russell. Now, at that time, uh, why, uh, we uh, thought that uh, this particular personality that Jesus foretold in his prophecy on the end of the system of things was an individual uh, man. Namely, uh, when Jesus said there to his disciples, who is the faithful and wise servant uh, whom his master will appoint over all his good? Blessed is that servant uh, whom his master on uh, coming will find so doing. Verily I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. And uh, we thought at that time that Charles Taze Russell individually was that faithful and wise slave. And now, to our horror, he dies and leaves us apparently without that faithful and wise slave. And who is going to take his place? Who can fit the niche that he failed? 
Well, we were left in perplexity. And uh, I recall how uh, the vice president of the society at that time did not feel uh, capable of stepping into the shoes of Charles Taze Russell. No. So uh, a committee was arranged for to carry on uh, the business of uh, the society. And uh, that committee uh, filled in the remaining time of the year, Brother Russell dying October the 31st, and the beginning of the year came uh, the annual election. And it was at that uh, annual election in uh, 1917 that uh, J.F. Rutherford was voted in as the uh, next president of the society. He had been uh, the legal counselor for the society under Brother Russell for some time, and he was therefore judged to be the most com competent person to step into uh, the shoes of uh, the deceased uh, uh, president of the Watchtower Bible and uh, Tract Society. And uh, certainly uh, Jehovah's Spirit was operative at that time in having him put into office. Well, now, a uh, mental sturgeon had asked uh, Charles Russell on the train, uh, who will write the seventh volume? And Russell said, uh, someone else will have to do it. And so it was that uh, during that uh, this long-awaited seventh volume of Studies in the Scriptures was brought out. And it was entitled, uh, The Finished Mystery. And it was written uh, by Clayton J. Woodworth and George Fisher. Uh, they collaborated together. Woodworth was specially noted for uh, his study of the book of Revelation, whereas Fisher was the one uh, who probed deeply into the prophecy of Ezekiel. And so uh, this seventh volume, The Finished Mystery, as it was called, uh, uh, had uh, the first section take up the entire book of Revelation, and the second part of the book uh, took up the entire uh, prophecy of Ezekiel. And of course the interpretation uh, was given to their understanding of matters and toward uh, uh, the course of human history as they saw it up to that year of 1917. Well, uh, the prophecy of Ezekiel had spoken about uh, the sword of Jehovah God that was going to be uh, wielded and how it would be wrapped up for the slaughter. And so when the uh, finished mystery was issued by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society at uh, Brooklyn, New York, why only certain ones received the first copies of that book. And it was through the mail and it was in a casing. And that was supposed to be an outworking of the prophecy that this sword spiritually speaking or figuratively speaking that book the finished mystery inside uh, was wrapped up you see uh, in uh, uh, this little uh, uh, box or container and I recall uh, that uh, my aunt Clara Lang why who lived with us at the time in Cincinnati Ohio 1810 Bay Miller Street she got a copy, and uh, all the others uh, uh, who uh, were singled out by the society uh, received copies through uh, the mail, and that was understood to be the uh, carrying out of uh, what the prophecy indicated should be done, that the sword should be wrapped up for uh, the slaughter. Well, now you can appreciate that uh, the finished mystery brought out there in that year of 1917, right in the midst of World War I, uh, could not have had the truth. Because 
Everything published up to that time was short-sighted. It did not take into account the fact that the remnant, the anointed remnant of the Christ's body were going to survive World War I and that there was to be a post-war period in which marvelous things, uh, unforeseen by us, us, unexpected by us, uh, things were going to take place in fulfillment of prophecy in the conclusion of the system of things, not before and up to the conclusion of the system of things, but during it. Well, we had been uh, expecting uh, to be glorified in heaven, to have a rapture and uh, being caught away and uh, transferred to heaven uh, back there in that uh, marvelous year of 1914 when the times of the Gentiles ended. And I recall how that uh, the war broke out there uh, in that year, July the 28th, and uh, it was at Brooklyn headquarters on the second day of October. Uh, he thought that the times of the Gentiles would end October the 1st. So uh, he waited until that uh, day passed and World War uh, I was now roaring away. And when he came down at the Bethel home, uh, uh, that morning from his room upstairs uh, to the dining room uh, to preside over the uh, Bethel breakfast, he stopped before he took his seat. And he clapped his hands to get the attention of the whole family. And then he announced, The Gentile times have ended, for their kings have had their day. He was quoting from one of the songs that we used to sing at that time. And so he announced to the Brooklyn Bethel family that the Gentile times had ended and their kings had had their day. And of course, in that, he was indeed correct because all the world developments uh, since that uh, time uh, have verified that we are indeed living in uh, the end of the world uh, about which Christ's apostles uh, inquired of him. We're living in the conclusion of the system of things. Well, as before stated, the uh, finished mystery, therefore, uh, with us taking up of world uh, developments up till uh, that year of 1917, uh, was far uh, short-sighted, was it not? Because it did not have the facts uh, to verify uh, that uh, it was a, a true interpretation of the books of Revelation and of Ezekiel. Well, to uh, our amazement, why World War uh, I came to an end uh, in uh, the year uh, 1918. But uh, in that noteworthy year, why, something took place out here in California at Los Angeles. As I recall the date, uh, uh, February the 21st, why, Brother Rutherford, the second president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, gave a talk there in uh, L.A., California. And what was the theme of his talk? something that electrified the world without a doubt because the theme of his talk was millions now living may never die millions now living may never die later on when we became more sure of ourselves the title of that talk was millions now living will never die and then when uh, we speakers of the society would be sent out uh, having assigned uh, topics on which to talk, why we would have the uh, title of the talk up above and underneath, there would be repeated the words, millions now living will never die. 
we just rubbed in that idea, you see, into the heads of the general uh, public. So uh, it was in the year 1918, after that remarkable speech had been given, and while World War I was still on, that the society's officers, uh, Brother Rutherford, President, and uh, W.E. Van Amber, the uh, Secretary Treasurer, and uh, uh, A.H. McMillan, a prominent uh, traveling speaker of the Society, and the, the two authors of the Finnish Mystery, uh, Woodworth and Fisher, and our little Italian brother, Giovanni Di Cecca. Uh, they were all brought to trial there in uh, the courthouse building in the federal court uh, uh, section. Uh, they are uh, under four charges of obstructing the government in the prosecution of the war and uh, in uh, inciting sedition. Four counts altogether, and uh, the court uh, found them guilty on all uh, four counts, and uh, they were sentenced to 20 years' imprisonment on each count totaling 80 years altogether, but the 20 years were to run uh, uh, simultaneously, and uh, so they would have to spend only 20 years in the federal penitentiary down there in Atlanta, Georgia. And so it was that uh, they were on the train down uh, toward Atlanta, and it was July the 4th, Independence Day uh, for the United States of America, and uh, I recall how uh, they told uh, talking things over as they were on the train bound uh, for their uh, prisons. So um, those were crucial years and uh, uh, years that uh, uh, put our faith uh, uh, to uh, the greatest uh, test that uh, one could imagine. But uh, we never lost faith in the fact that this was God's organization. This was Jehovah's agency that he was using at this time, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And uh, the world might condemn the officers thereof, and their associates in high office in the organization, but God was still with us, and uh, he was approving of us. And so uh, we uh, continued clinging with a death-like grip, you see, uh, to uh, what we uh, understood at that time. So uh, those were very, very uh, trialsome years as uh, you can imagine. And uh, we expected uh, still the end of the whole uh, shebang down here on this earth, the uh, political, com commercial, religious system of things. And I recall how uh, when Brother Rutherford was still in prison, and there our brothers, the leading officials of the society, were in the jug down in Atlanta, Georgia. Well, uh, it was uh, indeed a perplexing situation. And uh, we wondered what Jehovah would do about the matter. Well, the case of our brothers was appealed. And uh, the appeal was heard and uh, they were re released on bail after spending nine months in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. And oh, what a joy it was when our brothers were admitted to, to freedom. And immediately that they got out of the penitentiary, they started to work, applying themselves uh, to uh, the post-war era. And... Uh, examining into what the Bible had to say about it and what was the work that was now to be done. All unexpected uh, 
uh, was this uh, situation. And uh, certainly it called upon uh, looking to Jehovah God implicitly for his guidance. Well, I recall how the society made uh, uh, endeavors to get the friends together. To do was now to get them together and working together and taking care of uh, the job that Jehovah God had uh, for us to do in this unawaited uh, post-war epoch. So uh, the society wisely arranged for us to have our first convention at uh, Cedar Point, Ohio, on that island offshore from Sandusky, Ohio. And oh, what a, a great joy it was for us to uh, gather together in uh, uh, this first Cedar Point Convention. And I recall how among the other surprising things that developed at that convention, why Bob Martin, who was the uh, uh, factory manager and also the office manager of the society at the time, he got up on a box there uh, on the grounds. We were gathered together outside of the general convention uh, building. And uh, among other things that he uh, disclosed to us uh, was that the society was going to publish a new magazine. Oh no, this magazine was not going to displace the Watchtower magazine. No, but it was to be as it were, subsidiary to it, an adjunct to uh, the Watchtower magazine and published things uh, which it would not be appropriate or for which there would not be room in the Watchtower magazine. And uh, it was to be entitled, this new magazine, The Golden Age, The Golden Age, because uh, we uh, referred to the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ as the golden age. So, we rejoice greatly at receiving uh, this news. And we awaited uh, the reception in our homes of the first issues of that uh, magazine. So, uh, Jehovah God, you see, uh, was taking care of the spiritual uh, needs of his people. And uh, at the start, why the Golden Age magazine uh, was published by an outside concern. But then uh, the society undertook uh, a new bold venture indeed, because it established its own printing building or establishment, uh, 35 Myrtle Avenue in uh, Brooklyn, New York. It got its own little uh, uh, one-roller uh, uh, printing press. We refer to it as the Battleship. And it was installed over there in Brooklyn, New York, uh, 35 Myrtle Avenue. Well, uh, this was uh, quite a new uh, venture for the society to undertake uh, when here we had no uh, acquaintance with uh, the matter of uh, printing. Uh, we had left uh, the printing of the society's literature to these uh, outside concerns, and uh, they furnished us the literature for our reading and for our distribution. But now Jehovah God put it into the heart of uh, Brother Rutherford to, to buy this little printing press, our battleship as we called it, and uh, print the Golden Age for ourselves. So uh, it was just a small affair over there in 35 Myrtle Avenue, and I recall how at a convention my brother Rutherford uh, referred to it, and he says it's not the biggest uh, printing uh, machine in the world, but it's ours. And that was what made the difference, that we own that printing press, the, the battleship. So uh, it was operating as the uh, year 1920 came in, and uh, it was in that year that uh, I uh, 
was invited to come to headquarters. We held a convention down in Cincinnati, Ohio, and uh, uh, Brother Rutherford was there as the uh, principal speaker. And uh, while there, he inquired if there were young men who would like to come to uh, Brooklyn headquarters uh, to engage in the work there. And so he was referred to, uh, uh, to me by one of the elders, Brother Stemmler, and Brother Rutherford asked me if I'd like to come. I was pioneering at the time. I was free to come, and so I said, I'll be very happy. He said, well, write me a letter. I wrote him a letter, and a couple of weeks later, I got the invitation to come, and uh, so uh, it was there in the spring of 1920 that uh, I stepped into uh, the Brooklyn Bethel home to become a member of that headquarters family, and it has been a great mercy and condescension on Jehovah's God's part uh, for me to be continued as a member of that headquarters family down to the very present time. Well, uh, 1920 uh, uh, was a year of uh, developments, and uh, it was in uh, that year that uh, an expression came into vogue. And what was that? Well, uh, we were thrilled when the expression began to be used there at Brooklyn headquarters. God's organization, God's organization, God has an organization, a universal one, and it has a visible part down here on earth, and we have the opportunity and the privilege to become a part of that organization of the Most High God. Now, it's an old idea with us today. But that back there, it was brand new, and it was indeed thrilling to appreciate, to discern that the Most High God had an organization. Now, you know, there are many who uh, in uh, recent years deny that God has an organization, and uh, they've been dismissed from the Brooklyn headquarters because of trying to propagate that view among the members of the Bethel family that God has no organization. He has no people down here on earth who are distinctly and uh, uh, exclusively his people and the ones that alone that he is using to carry out his work. And that Christianity is not uh, a generality to which anybody can belong and people uh, who are not uh, incorporated with us and who are not uh, cooperating with us in getting this good news of the kingdom uh, proclaimed. But uh, in spite of uh, these denials on the part of uh, uh, these uh, who uh, have veered away from the society, the evidence remains stronger and stronger than ever that God has an organization and he's using it in a magnificent way uh, to accomplish the purpose uh, which he has forecast and set out fully in the prophecies of the Holy Scriptures. So uh, we started out the 1920s now uh, with this brand new idea of God's organization, and that we are the earthly, visible part of that organization, and we are entrusted with and under obligations uh, to carry out uh, this commitment of service, particularly Matthew 24, 14. This good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Well, the 1920s were very important years, and uh, at that time, uh, study, uh, a restudy was being made 
of uh, the book of Revelation, and uh, we thought that uh, the seven last plagues foretold in Revelation uh, would be fulfilled starting with general conventions held by the society. And the first of this series of seven conventions uh, uh, took place in the year 1922, and it was the uh, second uh, convention that we held at Cedar Point, Ohio. And I recall how on that occasion uh, uh, Brother Rutherford uh, gave the principal talk on the kingdom. Ah, yes, the kingdom had come to the fore uh, by then, and uh, we saw that uh, what we had considered to be the principal uh, uh, doctrine of the Bible was not the primary doctrine of the Bible. Uh, we used to have uh, published uh, uh, on a banner over our platforms at conventions uh, the words of 1 Timothy 2, 7, a ransom for all. The whole human family was going to be ransomed small little flock going to heaven and the vast majority of mankind are living under the thousand year long reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. A ransom for all to be testified in due time. And we saw that the salvation of mankind was only a second rate affair and that the foremost doctrine of the Holy Bible was the vindication of Jehovah God as the universal sovereignty. The universal sovereignty of Jehovah God was uh, the most uh, important uh, teaching and doctrine of the Holy Scriptures. It was the issue that was now before the entire universe. And so, uh, perceiving these things, why Brother Rutherford uh, gave that magnificent speech there on the kingdom. And he reached his climax by saying, the kingdom is here. You are its ambassadors. Therefore, advertise, advertise, advertise the king and the kingdom. And oh, how all of us there broke out in uh, applause. And uh, we were just thrilled through and through uh, by that magnificent climax uh, to a very eloquent speech. And from then on, we did begin uh, to advertise the kingdom as never before. And that was the thing uh, uh, that was held before us in uh, the remaining six conventions uh, that were held in uh, uh, this series. Well, now, we came down... Uh, uh, to uh, the uh, fourth of uh, uh, these uh, annual conventions, and uh, that was in the year 1925. Well, we had great expectations with regard to the year 1925. Uh, it was thought to be the last year of a, a series uh, uh, that the Bible referred to, uh, the 50-year uh, periods, 70 of them, they were supposed, uh, calculated at that time to end in 1925, and we thought that the uh, uh, world uh, uh, would undergo a transformation and the kingdom would come into a, a full uh, control of the earth. And uh, I recall how at one convention uh, uh, Brother Rutherford spoke and uh, he said, if you die after the year 1925, it will be your own fault. Well, 1925 came, you know, and it passed. And I remember how Brother Rutherford, speaking to the Bethel family, he confessed that he'd made a mistake. Well, that year, 1925, however, was a marked year. And do you know why? Well, because 
in the March 1st issue of the Watchtower, there was published Brother Rutherford's uh, outstanding article on birth of the nation, birth of the nation. And it took up uh, Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 5 where the Apostle John uh, sees this woman up in heaven and she is pregnant with child and she's going through her birth pang, uh, agonies. And uh, she gives birth to a man-child and it is caught up to heaven and seated at the right hand of God uh, to uh, reign with him up there. Now, according to that uh, seventh volume of scripture studies, uh, uh, that uh, birth of that man-child represented the birth of the papacy, the enemy organization of Satan the devil. That's the way it was presented. And now this article, Birth of the Nation, added from the pen of Brother Rutherford in 1925, showed that it was the birth of God's kingdom at the end of the Gentile times in 1900 and 14. And uh, when uh, we read this uh, correct explanation of matters, oh, how we readers of the Watchtower uh, were thrilled through and uh, through. And how uh, this uh, correct explanation of that outstanding part of the book of Revelation uh, helped us to grasp the meaning of all the rest of uh, the book of Revelation. So, uh, 1925, you can see, was indeed a marked year. And uh, we were just as pleased not to be in heaven, uh, but to be down here on earth and have this wonderful uh, work uh, that was yet to be accomplished according uh, to the prophecies of the Holy Scriptures. So, uh, 1925 uh, was marked specially uh, by uh, uh, that clarification of one of the key features of Bible prophecy. And then uh, came uh, the uh, fifth convention uh, in the following year of 1926, and that was held over in London, England. And uh, uh, we had a, a grand time there. Uh, the uh, general meetings of the convention were held at the Alexandra uh, Palace. And then uh, uh, for the uh, public lecture, uh, there was used uh, the Royal Albert Hall, which was the leading uh, uh, auditorium there in the city of London with its magnificent organ, the greatest organ uh, in the world. And it was played uh, during our uh, session there, and Brother Rutherford gave his uh, grand uh, speech uh, to uh, that British audience. And, uh, Royal Albert Hall has, uh, as I recall, four balconies, and the place was just packed out to the top. And uh, Brother Rutherford was in excellent form in uh, giving his public lecture there. I uh, recall how I was sitting on the platform uh, behind him as he was speaking, and, and uh, as he proceeded with his talk, all of a sudden a woman jumped up from her seat right down there to the left, and she began haranguing Brother Rutherford. And Brother Rutherford stopped his talk, and he said, Put that woman out! The devil used a woman in the Garden of Eden, and he's trying to use a woman tonight to break up this meeting. <laughs> well, did that British audience resent that? No, they did just what you did right now. <laughs> they applauded from top to do bottom, and uh, the woman was ejected, uh, and uh, Brother Rutherford uh, finished his talk. And uh, it was just a glorious occasion indeed. Well, the next day, uh, 
was Monday, and uh, we held a meeting for uh, the Jews because at that time we thought that the prophecies of uh, the uh, Hebrew scriptures uh, talking about the restoration of Israel uh, referred to the restoration of the literal uh, fleshly Jews, the circumcised Jews. And so Brother uh, Rutherford gave a talk on Monday night, not Sunday night, which the Jews do not recognize, but on Monday night, and uh, talked on comfort for the Jews, and uh, uh, we had an audience of several hundred of the, the Jews of that area, and uh, he did try to console them uh, with the hope that uh, the prophecies would be fulfilled in a literal way on uh, the fleshly, natural Jews, and that they would have Palestine restored to them. At that time, we never, never expected that uh, when the uh, British mandate over Palestine ran out in the year 1948, that the Jews would rise up. There were Jews back there uh, in uh, Palestine, over there in the Middle East, and uh, they held part of the city of Jerusalem, but not the temple area. No, the Mohammedans, uh, they held the temple area, and they had their Dome of the Rock, the Mosque of Omar, as we used to call it, uh, right where the Temple of Solomon uh, had stood. And uh, so when the British Mandate ran out in 1948, why uh, the Mohammedans seized uh, their part of uh, the city as now their national property, whereas the Jews seize the other part of the city of Jerusalem, including the Wailing Wall, where the Jews used to come and wail at the base of the wall uh, above which uh, the Temple of Solomon had stood. And so uh, uh, that area, that city of Jerusalem, remained divided until the year 1967, when we had the Seven Day War uh, between the Mohammedans and uh, the Jews, and the Jews came out victorious and they took over the whole city. And if you go over there uh, today, why uh, you will see uh, Jerusalem in uh, completely in the hands of the Jews. And so it was that uh, in that year of 1948, while making this seizure uh, of their part of Jerusalem, why uh, they established uh, the Republic of Israel, and they had their capital first at uh, Tel Aviv, and then when they got possession of all of Jerusalem, why they moved the capital up there. And thus the uh, Republic of Israel was not according to uh, what had been predicted uh, way back there in 1926 when uh, Brother Rutherford gave his talk on comfort uh, for the Jews. No, we did not anticipate that Jerusalem and that part of the Middle East was going to be seized by war and not just uh, conferred upon the Jews in a peaceful manner. So. Uh, the Republic of Israel today, and the way it has been uh, comporting itself, is no fulfillment of Bible prophecies at all. No, because the Republic of Israel is a part of the United Nations organization, the successor to the League of Nations, and we know that the League of Nations and its successor uh, the uh, United Nations organization is the abomination of desolation that uh, stands in the place that should be occupied uh, in the minds and hearts of the generality of people as uh, uh, God's uh, organ, as uh, his kingdom. So uh, in the minds of the people who accept the United Nations organization, why well, you can see that uh, the kingdom of God is being displaced by their resting their hope in the United Nations organization. 
And Israel belongs to that. So Israel is a part of the nations that are going to be destroyed utterly in uh, the oncoming war of the great day of God the Almighty, which will climax in the battle of Armageddon. Well, back there in 1926, why we did not uh, discern uh, these remarkable outworkings of things. But uh, we held our convention the, the next year in uh, Toronto, Ontario, uh, Canada, and then the final convention of the Series of Seven uh, uh, was held in Detroit, uh, Michigan. So uh, there were messages poured out upon uh, uh, the human family at uh, e each of those conventions, which we understood to begin uh, be the beginning of the pouring out of the seven last plagues that were foretold in uh, the book of Revelation. Well, 1929 passed and uh, we entered into uh, the 30s and that was to be indeed a decade of uh, remarkable history-making events because in the year 1931 uh, we held uh, the convention at Columbus, Ohio and uh, there what took place by the adopting of a new name. The president of the society, Brother Rutherford, talked on that subject uh, because God had said you will be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord your God uh, will uh, name. Of course, that prophecy is fulfilled uh, with regard to uh, uh, his organization, Visible and the new status that it would be given so that it would be called by a, a, a new name. But here now, uh, we uh, who were gathered together at that assembly uh, were informed uh, uh, that uh, it was the time for us to be given a new name because up to then uh, we had been called by uh, opprobrious, contemptuous names by our religious uh, foes uh, such as no hellers, because we did not believe in hell, and Russellites, and Rutherfordites, and uh, Millennial Donists, and uh, such uh, opprobrious uh, names uh, like that. And so Brother Rutherford pointed out that it was the time uh, for us to take upon ourselves a name uh, that would befit us and that would honor and dignify the God whom we worship. And so he proposed to uh, the assembly uh, there that this name should be Jehovah's Witnesses. And oh, how we applauded. And when uh, the vote was taken, why it was unanimously for the adoption of that wonderful name, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. And then when this was publicized to all the other congregations around the world, why the congregations likewise uh, took the step and adopted that name, Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, the newspaper uh, announcing uh, this adoption of the new name said it will not stick, but it has stuck. Right. So we're very, very grateful for uh, this honor and dignity of bearing the name of the God whom we worship. And uh, we put ourselves under obligation by adopting that name because it declares that we are witnesses. And so uh, we have to be witnesses to that uh, most glorious name of our God. And that means that we have to engage in the witness work Proclaiming uh, the good news of the kingdom, yes, the birth of the kingdom in 1914, and we also have to be our witnesses testifying to the one true and only name of the God whom we worship, to wit, Jehovah. So how favored we are indeed to be clothed upon uh, with that name. 
And then uh, in the 1930s uh, began to run their course from then on. And we recall how in the year 1933, uh, Adolf Hitler uh, took over the control of the Central European powers, Germany and uh, Austria. Uh, he had his Nazi party. And down there in Italy, uh, there were uh, those who were followers of Mussolini and the Nazi party of Adolf Hitler. Uh, they joined ranks. They became allies. And uh, so the whole world was now uh, put in turmoil by the rising up of these radical groups who were right uh, as opposed to uh, the left over there in uh, communistic Russia. So uh, the 1930s uh, were now developing uh, terrible things indeed uh, for the future. And uh, it was in the very middle of that decade that Jehovah God also did something. And uh, it was in uh, the middle of that decade that we were met together in Washington, uh, D.C., in this country. And we were holding a general convention there. And uh, it was on the second day of that convention, uh, May the 31st, that uh, Brother Rutherford dealt uh, with a prophecy of Revelation, uh, chapter 7, verses 9 through 17. Now, up till that time, we thought that the great uh, multitude there mentioned, King James Version, uh, was a secondary spiritual class. It was made up of those who had made uh, a failure in gaining the topmost position as one of the 144,000 uh, uh, royal associates with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven. And uh, these failures, uh, however, did not deny the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, uh, they would uh, prove their uh, uh, ad adherence to the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior down to the very death. And in the resurrection they would be uh, raised up uh, uh, as spirit creatures, um, and they would be uh, secondary to the 144,000 uh, kingdom associates of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there at that Washington Convention in 1935, Brother Rutherford pointed out that this was not true, and that this great crowd that uh, the Apostle John describes there in Revelation chapter 7 uh, was to be made up of Christians who were just as fully and unreservedly dedicated to the Most High God as the remnant of the little flock were, and that they were determined to serve Jehovah God and be his witnesses down to the very death, if necessary. So they were no second raters at all, but they were devoted to Jehovah God as fully as anyone in the anointed little flock. And uh, the grand thing about this great multitude uh, uh, that Brother Rutherford uh, brought out there uh, at that Washington convention was that they were to be of the millions now living that would never die. Ah, uh, just as Revelation says, these are they that have come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And uh, oh, how we rejoice there at uh, that information given to us in Washington, D.C. And uh, the very next day, Saturday, June the 1st, well, we had a baptism and there were 840 of those there at the convention that got baptized. Yes, uh, the Jonadab class had been specially invited to this Washington, D.C. convention, and they were there, and 
we had evidence that 840 of them were present uh, by reason of their baptism. And so now uh, the great multitude began to come onto the scene. And uh, what a pleasure it was to uh, uh, embrace them as our associates in uh, the witness work that we had uh, to deliver to uh, the farthest limits of the earth. So from then on, uh, the great crowd uh, began to form and to increase in uh, uh, size, in number. Those were very eventful years uh, that followed, 1936, 1937, and 1938. And all this while, you see uh, the Hitlerite uh, Mussolini uh, and Franco forces over there in Europe were gathering strength, and they were preparing themselves and equipping themselves uh, for warfare against the democratic uh, and uh, communistic forces of the world. So it was that uh, in 1939, why, Adolf Hitler carried out his threat. He said, on August the 1st, I'm going to march into uh, uh, this uh, country of Poland. And he did so. And uh, World War II broke out. Well, it looked uh, as if the end was up for this system of things. Our brothers over there in Hitlerite uh, Germany and uh, in Italy and in Franco Spain, uh, why uh, they were proscribed and, and they were imprisoned and held under detention, unable to carry on uh, their witnessing activities. And uh, now here, World War II had uh, emerged down here on earth. And I recall uh, Brother Rutherford and I were talking together and uh, he thought that the end of the system of things uh, had really begun, that we had reached the end of our work on earth. And I recall his saying to me, well, Fred, it looks as if the great multitude is not going to be so great after all. But he died too soon, did he not? Yes, he died uh, out here in California at Beth Sarim down there by San Diego on uh, the 8th of January. Well, before uh, uh, he died, realizing that he was reaching the end of his course, why he called for uh, the vice president of the society of Brother Nathan H. Knorr, and also the Society's lawyer, uh, Hayden uh, uh, Covington, and me to come out to visit him. And so we came out uh, there, and uh, he was able to get up for a little while and uh, recline on a chair out on the lawn, and we had uh, interesting discussions with him. And then uh, the time came for us to head back for Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we visited him and made our uh, final uh, visit uh, while he was uh, lying in bed. And we shook uh, hands in goodbye to him, and he said, he says, now you three stick together. And Brother Covington said, Brother Rutherford, we'll stick together until Hell freezes over, and then we'll skate on the ice. <laughs> well, Brother Rutherford died shortly after that, January the 8th, 1942. And now it became the time for the vice president uh, to take over, Nathan Homer Knorr. And uh, as we review uh, the history uh, of the visible organization of Jehovah God from then on, we can thank God that he raised up this uh, young man uh, to uh, act as 
a president of the society from then on till his death in 1977. Well, World War II was still uh, uh, going on, and uh, as stated before, it was thought that that was going to be the grand finale of this system of things. But no sooner did uh, uh, Noor get into uh, office as president of the society, then study of the prophecies of the Bible uh, were made, digging deeper, and uh, it was discerned that this Second World War did not signify the end of this system of things. There was going to be a peace period. And so it was that in that year, 1942, uh, the new president of the society, N.H. Noah, uh, gave that uh, outstanding speech entitled, Peace Can at Last. Ah, yes, it pointed forward to the end of World War II and the incoming of peace, and the question was, can it last? Well, it has lasted, on a world scale at least, down till this year, and how much longer this peace epoch is going to continue, uh, none of us know, but it appears that uh, its end is very, very close indeed, and that we are headed uh, for the overthrow of Babylon the Great and for the outbreak of the battle of the great day of God the Almighty at uh, the place called in the Hebrew scriptures Armageddon. So, Brother Noah, the new president, pointed out the fact that World War II was going to come to an end, and uh, so what was to be done about it? He lost no time, but uh, he saw that a great educational work had to be carried forward by us witnesses of Jehovah. And so he uh, bethought himself of uh, an educational work and of the establishment of a missionary school. Now, uh, we had, uh, the society did, uh, uh, a refuge farm up at South Lansing, New York. Brother Rutherford had thought that uh, during uh, uh, the oncoming great trouble, uh, World War II, that uh, we would be driven out of uh, uh, Brooklyn, New York, just as had taken place during World War I, when the society was obliged to move its headquarters from 122-124 uh, Columbia Heights uh, back to Pittsburgh, while our brothers were in prison, because of all the persecution and the opposition that was being expressed to us against us at uh, Columbia Heights. And so the society's offices were moved to some small quarters there in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, to carry on the work, at least to keep the Watchtower uh, magazine uh, going. Well, Brother Rutherford thought that uh, a similar uh, thing was going to happen, and so he arranged for this uh, Watchtower farm, uh, a refuge farm up at South Lansing. Well, there it was, and uh, I recall how Brother Knorr, uh thinking now of establishing a missionary school, uh, realized there was a need of a place uh, for it to function. And uh, he took me along, and we went up to South Lansing and examined uh, this uh, refuge farm building. And it was just the place uh, for the uh, missionary school uh, to be uh, uh, opened up and uh, to function. And so it was that on February the 1st of 1943, why the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead opened up there at uh, South Lansing of New York. And uh, it was called the Watchtower Bible School of Gilead because the name Gilead, as you know, means heap of witness. And by means of this missionary school, a great heap of witness was going to be piled up all around the world. And as I recall, there were uh, 100 students that were invited to make up the first class, 
and it was a great privilege indeed to uh, be there and uh, hear the uh, introductory speeches on that occasion, uh, February the 1st, 1943. And the school has grandly fulfilled uh, the objective that was set before it. Because uh, today we have missionaries all around the world and uh, they're carrying on a glorious work of witnessing. And uh, we have today the work uh, being uh, pushed in 203 lands all around uh, uh, this terrestrial globe. 203 lands. And uh, back there, too, uh, we did not have so many branches of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, but uh, today we have 95 branches of the uh, this organization that Jehovah God has used uh, now for over 100 years. 95 branch offices of the society. So they are supervising the work throughout the earth in these 205 lands and, and Jehovah God is uh, fostering uh, the work indeed. So uh, how favored you and I are uh, to be associated with this organization of the Most High God. God has uh, protected it, and uh, although we may be uh, prohibited, uh, proscribed uh, as witnesses of Jehovah God in some 40 lands a day, why, uh, nevertheless, the organization uh, functions on a glorious uh, grand scale in all of these um, more than 200 lands, and uh, the other sheep of the Lord Jesus Christ are being gathered together, and we are having one peak after another. And uh, the uh, previous speaker, Brother Sinclair, has uh, given to you some information on that part of the earth, that zone of our organization uh, that he served just recently and he reports the uh, fine progress of the work down there. So um, just how long uh, this peace period uh, that set in in 1945 at the close of World War II uh, is going to continue, uh, we uh, do not know. But. Uh, we are, all of us, whether of the little flock or the great crowd of other sheep, uh, wholeheartedly, unreservedly uh, dedicated to the Most High God to be his witnesses, and uh, that is what you and I are determined to be. I am certainly convinced of that. And how thankful we are that Jehovah God has made it evident that this witness work is his approved service today because he continues to bless it in spite of all the mounting opposition that is uh, uh, developing against our organization and uh, the work that we are uh, carrying on. So, beloved friends, we have uh, this work set before us and uh, how thankful we are uh, to be associated uh, with this instrumentality that the uh, Most High God has been using all of these years uh, down till uh, this momentous year. And the work uh, still is open for us to, to perform, and I'm sure that you mature brothers and sisters are determined to have a part in it until it is finished. And uh, the faithful and the street slave class that is referred to in Jesus' prophecy on the end of the world is still functioning. Uh, it's reduced to a small number. Uh, 
just recently, as I recall, uh, the number of these that partook of the memorial emblems at the Lord's evening meal uh, this uh, past year uh, numbered just about uh, 9,061. But we have all around uh, the globe uh, today more than 2,700,000 who are carrying forward this witness work on a grandiose scale. And the words of Brother Rutherford way back there in 1914 or 18 are truly uh, uh, being uh, verified because he said back there, millions now living will never die and by the grace of God uh, we are going on to three million dedicated, baptized, active witnesses of the Most High God with this wonderful outlook of surviving the worst tribulation in all human history, being protected through it, and going on into the glorious millennial reign of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a vindication of Jehovah God! That preservation of the great crowd of other sheep through uh, the battle of Armageddon uh, will be or a vindication of Jehovah God's almighty power to carry out his stated purpose and to protect his people uh, through the most vicious efforts of the devil's organization uh, to wipe out Jehovah's witnesses from the face of the earth. And Jehovah God will come out triumphant and all heaven well, we'll rejoice to see that he has preserved this great crowd of the other sheep uh, through that uh, uh, most devastating war of all times here on the earth. So we have a, a wonderful outlook set before us indeed. And uh, we uh, want to measure up to all the requirements uh, to uh, have realized in us uh, these remarkable prophecies for the immediate future, the protection of Jehovah's Witnesses through the great war of all wars at Armageddon and uh, entering in without dying into the new system of things with the opportunity set before the great crowd of other sheep of never, never, never dying off the face of the earth, so that millions now living today will never die. So we have the grandest of prospects set before us, and it's a great privilege to uh, stand before you this morning and to rehearse all of these facts of theocratic history in your hearing and I trust that you will remember some of these things and be uh, strengthened in your faith and your confidence and uh, in your determination uh, to continue on serving Jehovah God and holding to your decision uh, to be his faithful witnesses down to the end of this system of things and into the eternal future to his vindication as universal sovereign. Thank you.